Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. Now we are currently playing Aegeod Civil War 2. Uh, this is turn number 13, or at least episode number 13. I don't know that I could be so bold as to claim it's turn 13. It's episode 13. We're in early July of 1861. Uh, some of the planning and put together took more than a couple of turns, but here we are. So we're in early July. This is really historically when the uh, war kicked off uh, in Manassas in Bull Run. And you see here we have PGT Beauregard. He is currently activated, finally. And if we flip along here, it's showing him as locked. That's because of this headquarter support. We're going to take that out. And now we should see the Army of the Potomac, which will later become the Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee, is now active. So that's great. And they've got 1124 power. That's fantastic. We're going to take old Ben Huger here that we've shipped north. Now, you remember, might remember last time, uh, Ben Huger was leading this force. And I'll kind of zoom back out. He was leading this force just south of Richmond here in Petersburg. Um, but Ben Huger is a great artillery man. He's a level one right now, but he essentially gives an artillery bonus to every single element in the stack that he's in. So we're going to drag him into the Army of the Potomac. As you can see here, he immediately slots in right behind Beauregard. That's because of his seniority, which is a three. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Beauregard's seniority is a six. What's going on here? Well, that is true, but Beauregard is a three-star general, so he automatically outranks the one-star Huger, even though Huger has better seniority of three, uh, once we get out here to Holmes, Holmes is a five, so he slots behind Huger, and that's how that works. Now, we haven't been able to form divisions yet, which is frustrating because it's giving us all kinds of, of command penalty error here. here. Uh, we talked about this last time. We moved the big uh, brigade in here, and I can't remember if it was Cook's, Early's, Yules. It, I think it was Cook's Brigade we moved in here. Regardless, it doesn't really matter. We're way over and we've hit the max penalty of 35%. So we cannot have more of a penalty. Now you noticed I took the first headquarters support out. He's still building. Uh, when he builds, we will pop immediately to 20 because the headquarters support gives you two extra command. Regard that that is irregardless of the uh, 16 limit, so it's more like a bonus. We're gonna move him back in there, even though you say, well, wait a minute, this you know this locks the entire force. Not really. We're on defense here, so if the Union comes here, he will activate. And the whole stack is activated. So you've really, you'll see here, this added, you know, two, two more to our command, but we're still at a 35% deficit. It, or uh, this is just a penalty, essentially, to all combat. It will be that way until October. We can't form divisions until October. But we do have Beauregard up to 1121. That's nice, because we don't, we no longer have a Union force in Alexandria. Now you'll see the Union do this sometime where they pull back out of Alexandria to DC. Why is that? Well, they want to get you out of your entrenchment. You know, right now we have a, an expert entrencher in Beauregard. He's gotten us to a level three. Um, and so, you know, he is getting just massive bonuses for this entrenchment. So the Union pulling back here can sometimes be a very smart move for them because for a uh, maybe a less experienced Confederate player, the Confederate player is saying, hey, I, you know, look, we've got one uh, 
we've got one ground unit in here. It doesn't even say what, oh, it's the garrison, you know, which is 163 power. We've got 1121 power. But what happens is, you know, you move Beauregard here. Oh, I can't move. I'm sorry. I moved the headquarters support back in there. So he's locked. But it, if we moved that out and we move Beauregard here, now all of a sudden the union's like, great, let's go attack with a probing force. Okay. That drives us back to Manassas, but now we've got no entrenchment and it really sets us off to a disadvantage. And when we do that, then the union brings their main army here onto Manassas. Do not, as the Confederate player, do not unentrench, if that's a word, if you can help it. Okay, so up here we have the army of the Shenandoah. We've got Joseph E. Johnston, and he's now been put under pressure by Irving McDowell. Irving McDowell, um, well, this is interesting, right? Mc McDowell ends up becoming a pretty good core uh, general. He was not a good overall. He was put in charge of the entire Union forces and did not do a terrible job. He kind of held the line between McClellan being, you know, McClellan being appointed twice. Um, but McDowell was okay. He was better suited to be a Corps general. Now he's out here putting pressure on Johnston. Now you may say, well, he's in our region. Why is nothing happening? Because we're defending, right? So our posture is defend. Now we are putting up a stout defense. So we're going to stand our ground for the most part. We're not going to hold at all cost, which is the red, but we're orange, which means, you know, we're not going anywhere unless we're just getting routed. Uh, meanwhile, McDowell must be very passive in his command because he has not attacked us at all. And if you look at Johnston, uh, Army of the Shenandoah, you know, Johnston is a four defensive general. He's in command. He's fully uh, in command of all of his forces. And he's at level three entrenchment. He looks pretty good. He looks pretty good. Uh, it would be very, it would be suicidal for McDowell to attack him with a man-to-man -man force in this sense. So we're going to stay here. We've still got the rail line coming in here until we have some kind of supply problem. We're not going to do anything. Now we could turn this to offensive. I say we could turn this to offensive and we can. And if we did that, then uh, McDowell would, you know, pull us out of our entrenchment and it would be more than a fair fight. So we're not going to do that. We're going to stay defensive. Now here in Winchester, very important place, of course, we've only got two garrisoned. We've got uh, the Winchester garrison of militia. We've got the Winchester militia. We've got, oh, I'm sorry, this was the third Virginia local defense. So we've got a lot of just you know, basically local militia, they're really, you know, the mayor is out here on the streets with his rifle. It's not a whole lot. You know, it's the local towns, folks. Uh, we're not going to put them together because they would suffer even a more penalty. So let's put, let's just do it for a second, just to show. So now they're suffering a 15% penalty. We would rather they all be on their own and they all then just have a 5% penalty. Uh, we're not really worried about them, you know, kind of marshalling up a common defense. Now we've got Stonewall Jackson up here. His guys are still coming to strength. You know, it's, it's possible I moved him out here a little soon, but that's okay. We still want him to be blowing this rail. Now he didn't do it last time, Let's make sure he's got that order. He's out here now. It's possible he just didn't, you know, follow the order. But let's blow this rail line right here. This is a major Union rail line. Um, if he does it this turn, then I think we will bring him over to Winchester. Because as we see here, we don't know who this general is. We know that uh, they're actually a one or a two-star general. You can see that leader two-star general. 
they've got two regular infantry units and one militia unit. Uh, it's not that strong of a force. And really, you know, Jackson, once his manpower comes to force, and question whether it will now that McDowell's down here and kind of blocking our, you know, our reinforcements, because this all has to do with elements. If we look at him, his elements aren't at full strength. If you look over here, these elements have not been fully built yet. And that's something we haven't really talked about yet. The 33rd Virginia and the 27th are pretty much all the way built. The rest of these are not. When Jackson comes to full steam, he should be well over 200. So these are our main armies. You see them here to the left, Beauregard and Johnston, Army of the Shenandoah, and uh, Army of the Potomac. Now, what else do we have going on? We move Magruder up here, right? Because we have some forces building. We just kind of didn't want to leave them. On. Oh, look at this. Nice. So Mahone is ready to go. Uh, Magruder is running six for six. Mahone has a ton of elements, but a ton of combat power. So, as I said, Beauregard is already at full penalty. So we're going to bring Mahone's brigade all the way around. Uh, boy, let's delete that out. Let's think about this for a second. The... The Union is not in Alexandria. I mean, they have their garrison, but they don't have any troops there, really. Why don't we bring him up here for six days? There we go. Now we get him there in one turn. The chances that the Union can get a force down here, and a force that's greater than 210, because usually this would be cavalry, right? They're going to send some cavalry down here and see what's going on. Uh, we almost hope that. Even though these guys aren't being led, they've only got a 5% uh, penalty. Or, well, that's not right. Right now, it's costing 4 to lead them. They are a 20% penalty, but that's okay. They have a lot of combat power. 262 is what they could be. They're 210 because of their penalty. They're moving here 6 days and right over to Beauregard. That'll pop him up to like 1,300 or 1,400. So that's great. Now we still have this wagon train here. And we're just, you'll see the first reserve brigade under Johnson Bushrod has now activated, but it is as it's named, a reserve brigade. I like to keep these back. You've got the first, you've got the third, third i believe over here yep there's the third and there is a second somewhere i'm not going to hunt for it but the second reserve brigade is over here as well i like to keep them as a nice reinforcement group in case something starts to go wrong but anyway we have magruder here he's he's fully in command of his forces even though he's outside of the chain of command he's got a three two three so he's a pretty decent general. He activates most of the time. He's not, you know, great offensively, but he's, you know, average to above defensively. So that's fantastic. Uh, and it's nice to just have them sitting here. We don't really know where, you know, where is the Union going to go, right? Are they going to try to run this gap? Are they going to just take on Beauregard uh, face up? Are they going to go over here to Leesburg and try to get in between us? and the army of the Shenandoah, maybe uh, doing that in Winchester. But we have a lot of things going on here in the east, and, and for the most part, it's fine. We've got Vendor down here now. He's now part of the CSA detachment. You see the militia, we don't ever move them really. He's part of this detachment. He's taken this over. He's now a 322. We would like to give him another general, a brigadier that's at worst seniority. So he's an 89. That's not great, right? But we would like to give him another general so he's got no penalty. Right now he's got a 10%. We see here he, he really should be closer to 100. Anyway, you know, it, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but why don't we go back here to Richmond and see what we've got. Uh, Bushrod Johnson, you know, 
oh, here's our second reserve brigade. Remember I was saying, I know there's one, two, and three on the Eastern Front. Here's the second one, and here's the first one. Hmm. Question whether we should have them all together or need them all together. Why don't we take... I wish we had another general around here. So Venter still has the Huger supply, so we don't really need that. Uh, we're going to keep this separate, so I don't think it's part of the garrison. Why don't we take this first reserve brigade and take it down here to Vendor? Uh, that gives him a little more. Now, he's going to be even further out of command, or the command points he needs. Uh, right now, he needs four. He's got two. But we will be getting more commanders, so that's fine. And then what I wanted to do is take Vendor down this this rail line. So that's four days. We still have our Suffolk militia. They took over Norfolk, as you may remember. Now question, should we go to City Point or down to Suffolk? Let's click on to where he's going. Let's bring him one more. And we don't want him to merge with the militia. Let's just bring him right here. Okay, because really, you know, he's back here at Petersburg. What is he defending against? It's the southern approaches to Richmond. Uh, and that's fine. I mean, if the Union lands down here, we can just bring him right back here. Obviously, Petersburg is incredibly important. Look at all the rail lines running off of Petersburg. So it's very important. But let's bring him down here because I don't want the Union to get a free shot at Norfolk. Norfolk is really nice to have. You've got, you know, you've got heavy guns, artillery. We're building building these Marines. They're not all the way built yet. They're building up though. I mean, this is a nice, nice little force. You've got 139 power. I just don't want a big Union army to come here because they think it's not well defended. You also have this nice naval base where we have uh, several ships you know we've got a a deep ocean ship in the plymouth we've got gunboats that we can run back up the river we've got an ironclad so the more we can protect norfolk the better but we're going to bring him let's make sure i just want to make sure he's actually in suffolk so there you can move these around just make sure that the merge didn't go together. Now we have. You can see the order here for the Suffolk militia is to enter the structure. It seems they have not done that yet. Um, and so that's kind of what's going on in the east. We may see a battle here next time if McDowell gets adventurous. He may try to siege here. Uh, I really don't think it's going to work because we're getting plenty of supply. If you look over here, we're still in very good supply. You know, good luck to him. He did cut our rail line here, which uh, I'm not, you know, I hate to see that, obviously. Uh, we do need to make sure he doesn't go to New Market because where we can cut him off, he can kind of cut us off a little bit too. That became becomes a game of chess, who's cutting off who. Now let's look at, ja oh, let's go back to Johnston. I just wanted to explain what these red regions mean. That zone of control, see down here, and I didn't go a ton into zone of control in the tutorials, but if you look at this, it says, because of its mobility, your force can penetrate neighboring areas, which, which are at least 88% militarily controlled. Zone of control points generated by your possessions, 103. You can read all about this if you want to. I would rather just say we have a Union uh, army in force right here. We obviously can't just move here or move here without fighting them. That I mean, isn't that what zone of control really comes down to? So uh, it's realistic in that way. We just can't move here or here. And that's why they're in red. Now let's look at John B. Floyd here. Uh, John B. Floyd is getting away and it's fabulous. We got to hope that he doesn't get attacked, but he's, you know, he's almost, he's one turn away from here. 
16 days, and he's 30 days, so two turns, and he will be in Covington. So that's great. We have the third reserve here. We have a wagon train coming here. Uh, MJ Thompson's just waiting here to take command. Now, when Floyd gets down here, uh, we're just going to shoot him back over here. Because if you read this, it says, This ability, dispirited leader, applies if the leader is in command of the stack. So what we have to do is find a stack for Floyd where he's not the commander. So he's a seniority 73. Uh, as we've talked about, Thompson's higher than that. Thompson's an 80. Evans is obviously higher than that 90 because he's displayed to the right. So what we'll probably do is take Floyd and give him to Beauregard or Johnston to be a division commander. And then his dispirited nonsense doesn't, it doesn't matter. He's not in command of the stack. Uh, we have our Wises Legions here. They're three days out from Lewisburg. They're on uh, assault. They're on offense. So that's great. This all looks good, right? Um, vendor, there's not a whole lot going on here, except when I say not a whole lot, up and down the coast, there's nothing much going on. Most of the action takes place in Virginia, but we do now have the Carolina Department. So you may remember we built some um, volunteers here. Those are the Charleston uh, Guards. We have the Charleston Garrison. Uh, well, might as well. Let's just put them together. So that's, you know, they're just hanging out in Charleston. Probably a very good time during the Civil War. They're not in the heat of the battle. But the Carolina Department, we need to get these guys north. These are some really nice, valuable units. Our rail right now is 116. Um, and so let's see what happens. You can always keep the Carolina Department up or whichever, you know, unit you want. And let's take his index card and put him in Richmond and see how long it's going to take. 177 days. Holy Moses. We don't have that much time. Now let's try rail. Hey, it's 17 days, but this knocks us down to 87 Ah, now here are the questions you face. This is 17 days, so it's taking rail for over two turns. Should we march him north a little bit so it only takes one turn, then it ki kills our rail? I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to bring him by rail to Richmond. I say him. Who is him? Well, it's Bartow's Brigade, Second South Carolina, Georgia Cal. I mean, it's a, it's a real hodgepodge of stuff. Let's bring them to Richmond by rail in 17 days. So we've looked at the Eastern Front. Now let's go back and think about how I usually look at a turn. I've kind of been moving things because it's more exciting, to be honest with you. It's more interesting. Let's look through our almanac. Now we brought up our forces. We can come back to that. War production. We need more reserves. As you can see, you know, we have 90 conscripts. 81 war supply. We need some more reserves, but this early in the war, we're still not going to worry about it. We're just, you know, this is the least of our worries. We have to build armies. Um, okay, so up here, we are building forces that haven't completely built out yet. Now, you may remember, there's our headquarters support. He's almost ready, not quite. We have uh, in Mobile, we decided to build that brigade last time. Uh, Iberville is New Orleans. We decided to build uh, a nice little 20 you know, power unit out there. We've got a bigger uh, unit here, Priors Brigade, that's building in Nelson. We've got Norfolk. The Marines are still, but my gosh, these guys have been building forever. I don't really like Marines in this game, but okay. It's fine. We put them in Norfolk. It seemed appropriate. Let's put it that way. In Spotsylvania, we've got a nice, big, big, big uh, group building. And then we actually have some ships that are building the Tennessee, the Mississippi, and the Arkansas. 
we did not build those. Those are scripted events. The computer built those. But anyway, that production is going on right now. Various, we can increase the rail pool. Uh, we always want to do this when we can. $40,000 and 20 tons of war supplies. Jefferson Davis says thank you. Uh, increase the river pool. 50 and 25. We'll wait on that. We're still red, but we just increased it last turn. Headquarters, Virginia forces. So premium for volunteers. Let's read this one. Entice men to join. Okay. The event offers you four choices. No premium. Pay a small $1. Uh, medium, $1.5. Or high, $2 enlistment premium for new volunteers. Now, one of the problems we've had is getting enough conscripts. So why don't we just go ahead and let's just do medium. Do medium. Do medium. Do we do that? Huh. This may be because we don't have enough money. Uh, I actually am not sure why that's not working. Hold on. Let's come back to the screen. Hmm. It's not active yet. Uh, we maybe have to select something else i'm gonna look into that. i always i always put this pre oh <laughs> that that's what it is gentlemen you've got to click on the pin i was like eh, or the quill so let's do 1.5 dollars on that um and get some more conscripts all that's all that is right we're increasing the manpower or conscript pool so that's great um treasury we could still issue war bonds we're down to 755 we're still okay we'll we'll let that fly we could build some armories or arsenals here we have 225 and 50 i mean that's a lot right uh that takes up almost all of our war supply uh depending on how much you're getting pressured as the confederate player though maybe do this every turn if you don't feel like you need more troops because you're, you're using all of your money and war supply for one of two things. Either armories, arsenals, whatever you want to call them to build war supply, or on new troops. If you don't feel like you're getting super pressured, hit these every time. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to kind of let it go. Because I feel like it's a little expensive right now. The lowest is this 40 tons of war supplies which means we really could only build like two volunteer units uh so i'm just gonna let that one go this time uh government we're never doing those uh let's look at our objectives so our current morale is 101 okay it went down a point i don't even know why really uh win level defeat level total vp 615 we've got a little bit of a lead here we're still doing 53 to 53 the reason we pick are picking up some is because of the cards we play for the most part. Uh, Baltimore, Louisville, St. Louis, and DC are the main cities we don't control. Otherwise, we control a vast majority of them. But they were made objectives because really the North is the one that fights the offensive war. So don't be fooled by that. Um, so yeah, I don't think anything more to be done there. Let's go play our cards. We're not going to do demonstrations. I'm tired of spending money on that. It's not really doing us any good, I don't think. We're going to export bales. Let's come down here. Uh, there we go. That'll make us 15 grand. Let's, uh, we don't need landmines. We don't need to build outposts. We are going to go over here and look to the far west. Uh, in the next episode, which will be the second part of this turn. Um, but I really think those are all the cards we need to play. So that's good. Uh, let's do a further sweep of the map. I think we're good here in the east. We're still playing defense. Defense. We'll see what happens here. We're on offense. I hope he blows this this time. Uh, Floyd is coming back with his good troops. Uh, we'll have Covington. Now we have to watch New Market. 
if McDowell slips down here, we've got to try to make him pay for that, and we will, I hope. Uh, when we look out further west, let's back up a little bit. We've got this force in Knoxville. Now you see the Union here. The problem is, when you, especially when you play a really good human player, they're going to start coming down here and trying to cut this rail line because it is your main rail line uh, east to west. He's still up here in Ashland. He's at least a turn away, and we could rail these guys, assuming they become active. Uh, how much longer? They're one more turn, and they're active. Now, as we move further west, we've got uh, Zolister up here. Or Zolister. Zolikoffer is still up here. He's just kind of hanging out. He can't move. He's fixed. Not a whole lot's going on there. The Union did start to push down here a little bit. And, uh, you know, Hollins, he's doing his job. He's taking shots at people. He's offensive. But, you know, what can you do, really? They're sailing things down the mighty Mississippi. We still... Okay. Well, we haven't read our messages yet. We're going to do that next time. We were still kind of doing our sweep of the map. We've now got Leonidas Polk. And Leonidas Polk is a two-star general. He's not great. I actually think he's somewhat underrated in this game compared to how he was historically. He was not a bad general. So to give him a zero offensive and a one defensive, mm, questionable. But he does activate. You know, he's strategic. He's got a four activation. So that's good. And we've got a whole ton of junk here, right? It's all just kind of spread out. We don't even know what it all is. Um, but we're going to be putting all of that under Leonidas Polk very shortly. A two-star general, which gives him eight points. Uh, eight command points, of course, that will be cut in half. So he's got four until he can form an army. Now, we've heard that the Army of the West can form when it has a three-star general. Well, it does not yet. Ben McCullough is a very fine general, 422, but he's not a three-star. So we can't form the Army of the West yet. And we got to figure out what we're going to do with McCullough. We've got Price up here, right? We remember we've got Price up here. Uh, McCullough can take command of that, and that's probably what we're going to do. Uh, J.O. Shelby's come up here, and he's figured out that Nathaniel Lyon has moved down here. There are Union troops all over northern Missouri, and we're going to have to deal with that when we come back next time. I'm going to wrap this up. When we come back next time, we're actually going to read our messages, <laughs> which I always tell you to do first, but sometimes it's just a lot more fun to look at the map and see what's going on. Next time, we'll go back. We'll look at our messages, see what's important. Uh, we'll figure out what we want to do here in the West because we've now got McCullough activated. And we've got uh, Leonidas Polk, who has also shown up on the map. The fair preacher, Leonidas Polk. Uh, so anyway, as always, thank you so much for joining me here on Strategy Gaming Dojo. I'm enjoying this series. If I just get a few people to play this game, I'll be happy. I do think it's the greatest grand strategy game ever made for the Civil War, which is really saying something. Uh, so if you enjoy this kind of board game warfare and thinking through every turn and moving around your little pieces uh this game is fantastic i think i love it so as always thank you so much i'll talk to you next time goodbye